Perhaps the audience knows him better through his biographical works created outside of Chile, such as Jackie and Spencer, which explore complex historical figures like Jacqueline Kennedy and Princess Diana. However, the Chilean director Pablo Larraín's authenticity and uniqueness are most evident in the works he created in Chile. In the period from 2008 to 2012, Larraín made three films, referred to by critics as the Dictatorship Trilogy, including Tony Monero, Postmortem, and No. Larraín returns in each film of his trilogy to the dark Pinochet era as if it were a haunting obsession or a dark preoccupation. The idea of the past lingers in Larraín's cinema, considering it a shocking waking dream that still haunts and confuses reality. Larraín had been fascinated by Pinochet for decades, watching him on television as a child with an instinctive aversion. As a director, he created films about the dictator's destructive impact on his homeland. Larraín acknowledges that Pinochet is the main fuel in his creative engine, unable to imagine the kind of profession he would have pursued if the man were not present. All forms of storytelling need a crisis, some catastrophe, and coincidentally Pinochet happened to be his personal catastrophe. Pinochet moves through his films like a malevolent ghost in the background. We see the destructive impact, but do not see him. This time, in his tenth film, El Conde, Larraín decides to stare directly into the eyes of evil. Larraín builds his film narrative, co-written with Guillermo Calderón, around the reinterpretation of Pinochet Jaime Vadel as a 250-year-old vampire, faking his death and escaping to a dilapidated estate in the Patagonian countryside. Facing an existential crisis, the Count, as he prefers to be called, decides to stop drinking blood and renounce the privilege of eternal life. However, despite his disappointing and opportunistic family, he finds newfound inspiration to continue living in an unexpected relationship. Thinking he might finally die, the children of the fascist icon gather around him, hoping to discover the whereabouts of the wealth he amassed during his long and brutal rule. The audience believes that an artist becomes more responsible and entrusted when committed to historical facts. Larraín's narratives always disturb and unsettle the audience with unconventional angles through which he retrieves history. When criticised for not adhering to factual accuracy in his film No!, which tackles the massive media campaign that led to Pinochet's downfall in the popular vote for a new presidential term, he responded that the director is like a child playing with a bomb, never knowing the results of his actions. In his latest film, Larraín seems to be playing with more than one bomb in his hands. It's a film booby-trapped in reality, not content with blending reality with fiction, but manipulating the film genre itself to mix black comedy, political satire, and horror. When you see Pinochet in his official attire and cape flying over the capital, Santiago, hunting his innocent victims, he appears like a distorted and malevolent version of Batman or a superhero. Larraín describes Pinochet in his cinematic version as a superhero against evil. The blending of reality and imagination and their interaction to the point of merging serves as a distinctive narrative signature for the director. Perhaps inspired by Marx's famous quote, history repeats itself, first as tragedy, second as farce, Larraín brings Pinochet back to life on the 50th anniversary of his rise to power, but this time as a farce. The comedy, The Joker, leans towards exaggeration, caricature, and improbable situations, always an effective means in confronting evil. This marks the first time a film revolves around the character of Pinochet, and Larraín chooses to portray him through the lens of black comedy. What this satirical approach does is turn these larger-than-life characters into material for ridicule, diminishing their horror to a point where taking them seriously becomes challenging. The acclaimed director Mel Brooks talks about this approach to tackling historical villains, stripping them of all impact or allure. This is precisely what Larraine aimed to do with Pinochet. However, Larraine acknowledges that the most challenging aspect of making his film was finding the right tone. Yet, he found inspiration in Stanley Kubrick's masterpiece, 
Dr. Strangelove, where Kubrick daringly presented a comedic take on an imagined nuclear apocalypse at a very early stage. Larayan deprives Pinochet of any potential sympathy by stripping him of his humanity, transforming him into a real vampire that feeds on the hearts of his victims. One comedic touch in the film occurs when one of Pinochet's daughters talks to a nun who secretly came to perform an exorcism ritual on the Count. The daughter tells her that if she expels the devil from within him, there won't be anything else left. Similarly, Pinochet informs his servant that he is merely a nocturnal creature. The film begins with a comedic premise as the immortal Count grapples with an existential crisis, deciding to stop drinking the blood of victims. He feels desperately betrayed by his people after being accused of being a thief. Pinochet remarks that he would prefer to be called a murderer than be accused of being a thief. Consequently, his children believe it's time to discover the money their father hid during his rule before a nun appears in his life, injecting desire back into his dry veins, taking the narrative in unexpected turns. Lorraine succeeds in creating an evocative, gothic mood for his film. Drawing on the eerie and frightening, he weaves his scenes through graves, haunted, abandoned houses, infested with vampires, alongside the vintage guillotine making a reappearance out of its time. Cinematographer Edward Lachman, a seasoned filmmaker, borrows elements from horror cinema of the 1930s and 1940s, reminiscent of Murnau and Dreyer. This striking contrast between the film's satirical tone and its unsettling gothic visuals gives the movie an authentic feel, coupled with its unique narrative that cannot be linked to any other film. It's a truly distinctive story because it's very Chilean. The director doesn't shy away from violence with his camera. His film includes some intensely violent scenes, but the violence here is integral to his depiction of Pinochet's fascism. Throughout most of his dialogues, Pinochet repeats the idea that fascism starts with a smile, then moves to fear, and ultimately ends with violence, making violence the true face of fascism. The film also carries traces of a subgenre of horror cinema known as hammer horror, which refers to horror and gothic fantasy films produced by the British company Hammer Film Productions from the mid-1950s to the late 1970s. Films in this category were characterised by manipulating plots and characters from classic horror cinema, creating characters that are challenging to empathise with. In classic horror cinema, monsters often carried romantic undertones, but here the monsters are soulless, and corruption extends to all characters, even those who initially seemed innocent and angelic. Most characters are voracious, repellent, devoid of emotion or personality. The tone of satire, absurdity, and the black and white cinematography also maintain a distance between the audience and these characters, preventing intimate closeness or sympathy. Lorraine's approach to history also blends with a postmodern perspective, where the comical prevails over the tragic, leaning towards the absurd instead of logical analysis of phenomena. Postmodern features emerge through the intentional mixing of cinematic genres, combining dark humour, horror and political film, creating a film space that is challenging to define. Additionally, there's an optical quotation between the film's cinematography and several classic and non-classic horror films. This openness and inclination towards experimentation are crucial characteristics of postmodern cinema. French philosopher Gilles Deleuze, a prominent figure in postmodern thought, criticizes the idea of approaching power through an indirect symbolic language. In one of his debates, he says, If there are those who stand at our doors, besiege us, and threaten us like man-eaters, we must show them devouring human flesh. It is no longer a metaphor, but a demonstration. This is precisely what Larian does in his film, as he strips Pinochet of any metaphor or analogy, portraying him literally as a bloodsucker. We see him tearing open the chests of his victims, extracting their hearts and consuming them or blending them to create his favourite drink. This liberates the meaning and intensifies the reality.
Lorraine states that one of the main reasons for making this film is that even now, 50 years after the tragic rise to power of Pinochet, there is still a segment of the population, up to a third, who continue to hold him in great respect. They see him as a skilled manager of state funds and a strong fortress against socialism, echoing the same old Western argument planted by Pinochet himself. In Larianne's film, Pinochet escapes any trial, much like he did in reality. This immunity to justice renders him immortal, like a vampire. The film concludes with a new birth, as Pinochet is reborn as a child with a different name, yet carrying within him the entire darkness of the immortal Count, who transcends time as a cosmic principle. With this ending, Larraine poses a loaded question. Why does history need to repeat itself to remind us of the danger of things? The film premiered at the Venice International Film Festival in its recent edition, held from August 30th to September 9th, where it won the Best Screenplay Award in the official competition. The film is now available for streaming on Netflix.